first guest today we want to start off with Joe Rieger. She's the professor and chair of Department of Sociology, Anthropology, Social Work, and Criminal Justice at Oakland University. You cover a lot of topics. And right now, during the pandemic, there has been a re-energized of social justice with so many protests. And then we saw the latest protest over the weekend in the city of Detroit. What a time for you to be a professor, huh? What's your take on everything that's going on? Well, I think, you know, there's there's so much to think about. And I think one of the questions I get asked the most is, you know, what's going on? Why, why now? Um, why George Floyd? Why does this keep continuing? And so it makes us think about how social change really happens in this country and that often social movements, you know, they build and they build and they build and then something comes along and it just, it's the right moment for things to, for protests to happen, for people to gather, for change to start to be talked about. So during the pandemic and with COVID-19, we've seen the disparities of our entire society come to light. So do you think that helped re-energize this movement? Well, I think, you know, I think the pandemic played a couple roles. The first one is we have seen the health disparities. We've seen by zip code who lives where and what race they are and the rates of infection. And that has everything to do with healthcare opportunities, poverty, um, just a, a range of institutions that we see are really failing a portion of our population to keep them safe. So I think that's part of it. So that's become more and more evident. But I also think with the pandemic, we've been home. So we're on our phones, we're looking at the news, we're, you know, we're not just noticing an event and moving on in our life. A lot of us have had time to really kind of dig into the news of the day, to think about what's going on. And I think that's played a role too. So what are your thoughts on what what makes a movement continue to fuel long-term change? Well, I think, you know, a lot of times we make this mistake that um, it's only when we see big national protests that a movement's in existence. You know, Black Lives Matter as a, as a protest movement really builds on the civil rights movement of the 50s, 60s in this country, um, has been active for a while, active at the grassroots community level. And so, um, you know, now we're in a place where we see all of these very visible national protests partially because they're getting a lot of attention, right? So those protests could have existed in the past. So what keeps it motivated is that people continue to be active even if we don't see them all the time in the public sphere. And when issues aren't dealt with, when, um, you know, I think for a lot of people when, George Floyd was killed, we're like, this is enough. We've seen so much of this. We can't see any more of it. And now it's continuing and we see how those keep sparking individual events. So part of it is that movements don't go away, but part of it is that um, issues don't get resolved completely either. Joe Rieger with us on the Oakland County Megacast, professor and chair of the Department of Sociology over at Oakland University. You have such great insight to offer your students how do you encourage them to get involved do you encourage them to get involved or what's the historical aspect of this well i think for our students what everybody here at oakland wants is we want our students to know how to um, look at information and to evaluate whether it's trustworthy, where it came from, you know, who's saying it. So we want them to have what we call information literacy. Um, But we also, I want my students to do critical thinking. I, you know, it's not my job to make my students into activists. It is my job to help students think about the world around them through a critical lens and to think about what kind of forces there are in society that shape people. And a lot of that can happen with a historical lens. So you can, you know, if we're going to talk about things like Black Lives Matter or the Me Too movement of a couple of years ago, we have to look at where all those issues came from and that we have a long history in this country 
of addressing these events um, of protest movements forming. And I think that's what I really want my students to think about is these are not new things. These are old things embedded in our society. And how are you going to look at them and think about them in a way that weighs, you know, the ideas and the opinions you're being given and that you weigh the facts and make um, an informed decision. And that's what I think makes a, a good citizen. We are speaking with Joe Rieger from Oakland University. We forget, I think, sometimes uh, when we had like the Million Man March, um, and those were more recent and to the younger generation can kind of remember it. But when it comes to the long-term civil rights issues or women's voting rights, as the older population that was a part of these protests that helped spearhead these movements, as they age and die off, those stories aren't told. It wasn't easier for this newer generation to kind of forget the importance of being involved in how change happens? You know, that's an interesting question because I think right now we're in this moment where um, young people in particular, and I'm talking high school, um, college age people, are very tuned in to all of this. Now, they may not know the histories and the complicated histories, because one of the things we do is when we tell the history of something, we make it very simple. And we lose all kind of the interesting complexities of, you know, the civil rights movement. And, you know, Rosa Parks becomes an old lady who sat down on a bus. And that's really not her story at all. So I think they don't necessarily have that. But I do think they're really tuned in and they're very concerned about what's happening in the world around them. And I think a lot of what we're seeing happening today is really being led by um, young men and women. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter marches that were organized by high school students. And so this is something where they may not have the complete history, but they do have the passion and they are looking very critically at the world around them. So generations build generations. You learn from the past, you learn from people before you, and that's what a lot of our younger people today are doing. They're taking lessons from the civil rights movement, from the women's suffrage movement, from other so sociological movements uh, and justice movements in the past in our country, and now they're taking action. So what do you see with, the, with, our, with this younger generation, millennials like myself, Gen Z behind us, that are taking such, such action uh, in favor of social justice movements where do you see that next culture shift coming uh do you think when this when these generations are coming into power and are older that we're going to see a shift in what in the in the power dynamics of our country you know i think we could um we know that um social protest does make a difference and sometimes where it happens is it may be aimed at laws or policies but a lot of times what happens is it diffuses into the culture. And so, for example, today, there are many things that the women's movement wanted that we now kind of accept as normal, like boys and girls are equal and they can both play sports and things like that. So I do think there's a culture shift coming. Um, I think that it's not going to be completely driven by the young because we also know that in these protest march, there's there are people who um, are of all ages there. So there's something about when people begin to discuss the issues that are happening in culture, um, that are a part of the culture, they become a little more critical and notice things, um, that there is a shift coming. Now, all shifts come with backlashes. So we know this, that when movements move forward, often there are forces in society that push them back. So it'll be interesting to see where we are in the next five, 10 years, um, how people are going to be thinking about these issues or is there gonna be a backlash pushing back against some of them? Joe Rieger, professor and chair of the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, Social Work and Criminal Justice at the Oakland University joining us on the mega cast what an exciting time right now with everything that's going on in our country to be a professor and to have these movements and these issues front and center to help address what is happening in our society does it help the younger generation or your students relate to historical events uh, in a bigger lens <laughs> 
Um, I think it does. Um, I think it's I think it's important for them to think about kind of, you know, to get this sense of this history. Um, I think we forget that, you know, we're at the hundred hundred year anniversary of um, women's suffrage. Uh, women begin to articulate this and work for 72 years. Many of the original uh, women working for suffrage um, died before they ever saw the chance to vote. So I think when we start to put things in that context that, you know, history, our history isn't that old for a lot of things. Um, you know, the Voting Rights Acts of 1964 and 1965, which largely re-enfranchised um, African-American uh, men and women in this country, that's not that long ago. And so I think having that sense of the immediacy of history is important for students to understand because it makes it seem like it hasn't always been this way and that people worked very hard to have some of the things that we now enjoy today. So with so many movements going on and so much passion around so many different issues, historically, what has made a movement successful that has moved from a protest into policy and change? Well, I would say probably the most important ingredient is, is time. Um, movements often have goals that they work a very long time for. And if, if for example, if we take the LGBTQ movement in this country, um, this movement has been in existence in this country in one form or the other, really organized since the 1930s and 40s. Um, but now we see here in the 21st century, we have marriage equality, still many other things to go. So what it takes is, it takes organizations that are able to sustain themselves over time. It takes communities of activists who are often embedded in networks or what we call grassroots in their communities, keeping working on issues. It takes institutions like LGBTQ centers, LGBTQ studies like we have here at Oakland. Those kind of things have to be in place for a movement to survive over time. And as it does, we're able to gain more and more um, laws and policies. At the same time, culture begins to shift. And sometimes those things have to come together. So for a law to be passed, the culture has to shift at the same time. Joe Rico with us. She's a professor and the chair of the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Social Social Work and Criminal Justice at Oakland University with us on the Oakland County Megacast today across our family of TV, radio, and other media outlets. Joe, you've written extensively on the women, on women's movements and on feminism as well. Uh, so shifting over to women's movements and the uh, development of those over the course of history. We're looking at recent years where we've had major party, po major political party involvement by people like Geraldine Ferraro, Hillary Clinton, Sarah Palin, now Kamala Harris is on the vice presidential ticket for the Democratic Party. How far along has the movements that were spearheaded early on by people like Susan B. Anthony come and how much further does that still need to go before we're at a point where the goals of these movements are being truly fulfilled? Well, I think, um, you know, women have made some major um, gains in terms of thinking about politics in this country. We have more women in politics now than we ever have. Um, we're still not at a point where there's some sort of equality in terms of men and women in um, Congress, in Senate, um, as, as presidential candidates. And, you know, as we saw with the candidacy of Hillary Clinton, no matter how you felt about her as a candidate, she had a kind of scrutiny that male candidates very rarely have. Um, her pantsuits, her hairdress, her, the way she wore her hair, um, her demeanor. Um, and we're starting to see some of that again with um, Kamala Harris. Like, how is she carrying herself? Is she too aggressive? Is, and so I think those, those are cultural things, right? Those are shifts we have to make about kind of what we expect women to be and how we expect women to act. Um, and as long as we have those kind of notions that hold women to a different standard and critique them in a different way, I think we're still going to have trouble having just equality because we're, we're, we're tending to judge women in different ways. So I think, you know, I think if Susan B. Anthony could see today, I think she'd be delighted. Um, I think she'd be, she was a radical, you know, she, she was not a mainstream person in her and her time, I think she would be delighted, but I think she would also be, I think she'd also be concerned that um, women 
when women won the right to vote, we didn't change the political system in the way I think she thought it was going to happen. So interesting to have you on our show to speak about these topics. I mean, because we're still seeing that today, even with Governor Whitmer, where during COVID, the conversation was shifting to, well, who's doing her hair? Who's doing her makeup? Where we wouldn't ask that if it was a man. Right. Exactly. You know, and, and some of the things that people have said about her, it, you know, it, it's frankly very what we would call misogyny, right? It, it's just, it's instead of engaging with her as a politician who's, who's making decisions, whether you like them or not, and critiquing those decisions, it gets really nasty um, really quickly um, about her as a woman. And, and so that tells us that we, we don't really see that about, we don't really see that about men. Um, so, you know, it tells us that we still have, we're not having even the playing field when it comes to electoral politics. We know women still have trouble uh, raising the same amount of money as men do, uh, you know, things like that. So we are thinking about all of those things when, you know, we're thinking about what's happening today. Professor, with the influx of 24-hour news cycles, social media has really change the way we're getting information how we're getting information people feel bombarded right now with so much negativity do you think that's going to have a long-term impact on our history and some of these movements and where we go from here next you know i think there are people who are glued to social media because they find it really you know, my daughter said to me today, um, you know, TikTok is where I find out about most world events. So there's that, right? So there's something about how we're getting information. Um, a lot of times that that comes in a negative cast. But I also think that part of the whole rise of these Black Lives Matter protests is because we saw it. We saw George Floyd die. Um, over and over again to the point where people were saying, please, please stop doing this. This is becoming, a, you know, this is this is not information anymore. There's something about this that just feels really distasteful to show someone's death repeatedly. But I think sometimes when people see, they, they understand things differently than when they just hear. And we know this, you know, this is a, a lesson learned in the civil rights movement. When the TV cameras saw the high school kids with the police dogs set on them and the fire hoses, people in the North who had never, who had heard about these things but never seen it, began to call their legislators and say, why is this happening? You know, how, how can this be America? So there is something, you know, I understand the negativity turns people off and it's hard. There's a lot of misinformation, but there's also something about the fact that we live in such a visually connected world that is very powerful for some movements. So we are speaking with Joe Rieger, professor and chair of the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, Social Work, and Criminal Justice at Oakland University. Just a couple more minutes with you here on the Megacast. We, you spoke of George Floyd, but then over the weekend, we also saw the shooting of the individual in Wisconsin, who was a black male who was shot in the back. And I tried to never jump to conclusions on these cases because we never know all the surrounding events. But when we are still seeing things like this, because everyone does have a camera on their cell phone, do you feel that this movement is going to have a lasting impression on the police agencies, law enforcement? So in 20 or 30 years, we're going to be talking about this issue like we were talking about voting rights in the past. I think it is, and I'm really glad you brought that up because um, I have a colleague who um, studies policing, and we're actually going to be taking part in um, what's called an office hours from the uh, Center for C Civic Engagement here at Oakland, and anybody can join us, but there are going to be three of us, um, Jay Meehan, Watoy Robbie, and myself, and we're going to talk about protests, policing, and communities, and kind of what's happening now. And he's really an expert in this area of policing and how policing has changed over time, how protests um, bring about it. And then my colleague, Watoy Robbie, is gonna talk about the way communities really respond to 
policing, fear of police, and the protests that are happening. So that's going to be September 2nd here at Oakland. Um, and so people, I would really encourage people who are interested to come and listen because I really appreciate the expertise of my colleagues to talk about things like, you know, what's happening in communities, what's happening with policing, where do we, where have we been and where could we go? Professor, we thank you so much for taking time to speak to us this morning on the Oakland County Megacast. You have so much knowledge and so many insights that you are able to share with us and our listeners and viewers. So again, everyone out there, September 2nd, we'll look forward to engaging in some of those events that's happening through Oakland University.